So you're now speaking about the fact that consciousness precedes the brain. It's not necessarily, brain is not producing consciousness. And this is what, from a materialist, you went all the way to the other spectrum. Well, that is true. And uh, it turns out that's where the scientific community is headed on this. Yeah. You know, neuroscience and materialist science have never uh, come up with any kind of um, linkage to explain how consciousness might arise in the brain. In fact, uh, what they try and do is tell you it's all chemical reactions, electron fluxes of material substance following the laws of physics, chemistry, biology. So, but quantum indeterminacy is what changes all this. Quantum physics completely upends materialist science. And that's why it's so beautiful that the Nobel Prize in physics in 2022 was given for entanglement. Entanglement is the most prominent feature of of the mystery of quantum physics, and it's right at the forefront of demonstrating the primacy of mind throughout the universe. They were really working with one mind. Peace and riches, blessings. I am Michael B. Beck with the host of Take Back Your Mind. Peace and blessings, everyone. I am Michael Beckwith, your host of Take Back Your Mind, where we have a weekly conversation with individuals who have, in some way, shape, or another, are assisting us to take back our mind, expand our consciousness, our awareness, open our hearts, and become aware that that we are actually awareness. I have with me today, and we've been together before, on my previous radio program, where radio was king, now podcast is king. (laughs) I have Dr. Eben Alexander. His career includes decades as a physician and as professor at Harvard Medical School and revered teaching hospitals. And once staunchly committed to the materialistic worldview, the belief that the physical world is all that exists, that was in the past. His scientific belief system was altered by his 2008 transcendental near-death experience, an odyssey into another realm during a week-long coma. Despite a bleak medical prognosis, Eben awoke to an inexplicable return to full health. His medical case and recovery were validated in a peer-reviewed journal of nervous and mental disease. Since his near-death experience... Eben has been reconciling his rich spiritual experience with quantum physics, cosmology, and more. There's so much here about Eben. We're talking about the the philosophy of the mind. He speaks about the world to educate the role that consciousness plays in wellness, healing, and recovery, and has been featured in more than 400 media interviews and numerous radio and digital podcasts. His number one New York Times bestselling author of Proof of Heaven, The Map of Heaven, and Living in a Mindful Universe. Dr. Evan, welcome back. Michael, it's so great to be back with you today. Thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. Uh, When I was thinking about, uh, I was thinking about you a couple of months ago, and I was saying, I got to have Evan back on here. Uh, Good. Primarily. I've been thinking about you too, so I'm glad we're back together. Absolutely. Now, give individuals the recount of what happened to you. I mean, I know, and now millions of people know, but just in case there's some people out there who don't know who you are and what happened with you, 2008, what actually happened? Well, you know, I was 54 years old. I owned a kind of conventional scientific worldview, thought the brain creates consciousness. I fully subscribed to the uh, philosophical position of physicalism or um, materialism, you know, that the brain must somehow create consciousness. But that also means that when the brain and body die, our conscious awareness disappears. And that's where my gift of my near-death experience due to severe gram-negative bacterial meningoencephalitis back in November 2008 was such an incredible gift to my life. Uh, and I've spent the last 15 years reconciling that and making better sense of it. 
kind of briefly, because I do want to have a lot of time for conversation, but uh, my near-death experience during this uh, case of meningitis, uh, first of all, uh, started with amnesia. I had no memories of Evan Alexander's life, no knowledge of our language, earth, humans, this universe. It was an empty slate. And that's wow. very unusual for an NDE. And I came to recognize in the months and years afterward that that was all crucial for me to get some of the deepest lessons of the near-death experience. It had to have that unusual feature of amnesia to show me much more about memory and conscious experience. And then my journey started in what I call the earth or my view, primitive course on response and kind of subterranean realm. Uh, when I describe it to people, they think, wow, that must be hell or purgatory. But to me, it was not very disturbing. It was the only thing I knew. So I just accepted it as reality. The good news is it didn't last forever. They came me slowly spinning a uh, pure light that opened up like a rip in the fabric of that er ugly earthworm's eye view and led me up into this brilliant ultra real gateway valley. Now, this is the, the place where so much of near-death experience would occur. Important to point out that it's a timeless realm. You know, people often talk about in near-death experiences a life review where they can witness their birth, death, everything in between, but they experience it simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Kind of astonishing thing. It's one of the features of these experiences that makes them so difficult to report in our language because our language really doesn't cover that kind of extreme uh, kind of interrelationship and overlap that's apparent to us during a life review. At any rate, during my journey in this beautiful gateway valley, I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing, millions of other butterflies looping and spiraling in vast formations uh, above this uh, absolutely uh, gorgeous uh, meadow surrounded by forest and sparkling waterfalls into crystal blue pools. That world was a world uh, much more real than this one, and yet it was a world where uh, so much becomes clear to us about our soul's journey. Uh, the best part about that feature was that I wasn't alone. There was a beautiful young woman beside me, sparkling blue eyes, high forehead, high cheekbones, uh, and a broad smile. And she never said a word to me. She never had to. But her deep truth, her emotional truth came to me uh, as the most reassuring and affirming message of my entire journey. That message to me from her, um, and this was the way I recorded the words weeks later because it was delivered as pure conceptual flow, you are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have mm -hmm. nothing to fear. You were richly cared for. Uh, and also the statement, as I put it in Proof of Heaven, uh, the statement, you can do no wrong. I wish I'd explained all that a lot better in Proof of Heaven, because by that point in time, that beautiful loving realm with that ambience of God love everywhere around me, uh, what that meant is when we have a life review, you know, any of the selfishness or greediness or handing out pain or suffering to others looks especially bad in that context. And that's what I meant by you can do no wrong as long as you're willing to accept these beautiful lessons of love that come naturally out of near-death experiences and similar uh, types of experiences that are a deep dive into the spiritual realm. Um, turns out that uh, from that point on, it was uh, a journey kind of upwards. I remember seeing thousands of beings down below us in the meadow, dancing, lots of joy and merriment, festivities, all being fueled because up above were these angelic choirs emanating chants, anthems, hymns that would thunder through my awareness and remind me of this beautiful uh, kind of oneness and spiritual home nature of where I was. Even though the words may sound foreign to people, there were thousands of people who contacted me after Proof of Heaven came out, telling me that my experience reminded them of something deep in their own memory. Of between lives or past lives or what have you, but something about a deep spiritual truth that we all share. Um, and it turns out that uh, that was only a gateway, as I said. That was not my final endpoint. And I remember all of four-dimensional space-time collapsing down this material world uh, with its uh, kind of very uh, uh, limited temporal progression and our temporal ideas. of, And then all of that richer spiritual realm now, remember, as I said, this is a timeless realm where all of our lives can appear to us simultaneously, all the events, and it makes much more sense when we see in that big, pure form. Uh, but it also becomes clear that uh, the best way towards uh, ascendance as a soul on a soul journey is to always manifest that unconditional love, mm. kindness, compassion, 
mercy, acceptance, when necessary, forgiveness. Uh, and then I was off into the next level. And I remember all of that spiritual realm and deep time or meta time, that different ordering of causality that's much grander than earth time, all of that collapsing down until I was in what I call the core. I went through another kind of light wormhole uh, in the process of getting there that was created by the music of those angelic choirs. And in the core realm, I was told, you're not here to stay. You'll be going back. We'll teach you many things. And there were so many lessons that came with all this, but central to all of them was the importance of love and the binding force of love and how that can bring us into wholeness and healing in these lives. Now, it turns out I would spontaneously tumble back down to that earth where my view from that lofty sanctum sanctorum of the core realm. Uh, but every time I would be led back through these musical portals of light that would lead me up back into the Gateway Valley, the beautiful guardian angel on the butterfly wing, always reassuring me of that beautiful message that I belonged there, that I was deeply loved and cared for, and then ascending to the core realm for, for yet more. Uh, I had several visions and all of this, even though I couldn't have an Eben Alexander life review because of my amnesia, I witnessed life reviews and reincarnation in very strong fashion uh, in, uh, in ascendance of, there were two particular uh, visions I had, one the flying fish vision, but even more impressive was what I call the Indra's net vision uh, of seeing all of our soul lines as these interwoven threads in this beautiful tapestry that held at golden center. So in this view of reincarnation that, that we propose from the near-death experience, uh, it's not like, uh, for example, in Buddhism, where it's a wheel of suffering and you're trying to get off of it. This is filled with grace and mm -hmm. simply souls becoming one with the divine. But you can't do that in one lifetime. Uh, you know, I had to answer all that scientific evidence for reincarnation. I didn't even know it existed before my coma. But when I came back, I had to do my homework. And I found that, for example, at University of Virginia, uh, they've studied reincarnation for the last 60 years and have more than 1,700 solved cases out of 2,700 cases investigated of past life memories in children suggestive of reincarnation. But don't worry. Uh, the, the, the important thing to get about this is our loved ones will always be there for us when we cross over. That is the most common uh, feature of near-death experiences across all cultures. Uh, and that is certainly what I witnessed in, in beautiful measure. That's that guardian angel. And it was only four months after my coma that I even knew her identity. Because when I came back to this world, I'd never really read much of the NDE literature. But now it was time to dive in. Although my older son, Evan IV, majoring in neuroscience in college, had advised me to write everything down before I read anyone else's near-death experience. Mm -hmm. That's the advice I've ever gotten. I wrote about... Uh, uh, 20,000 words over six weeks. And then I had a strong database just of my experience. But it turns out uh, at the end of all this, what happened is, is they told me I wasn't in the core to stay. And so one of these passages back through uh, where I was now down in that earth where my view starting back up, I realized that I can no longer conjure up the, the light portals with a musical memory. Uh, to say I was sad at that point would be an understatement, but I also knew I could trust that I would be taken care of. And it was at that point that I saw thousands of beings going off around me into the distance, heads bowed, uh, many murmuring, and this uh, energy coming from them in that murmuring. Even though I didn't understand the words, it was very refreshing and loving, very much like the surprising uh, kind of sense of spiritual home uh, and being uh, comfortable with the Gateway Valley and Core Realms in my earlier passages. But now I was getting that in this lowest realm because all these beings were offering this energy, which I called in my writings weeks later, the power of prayer. And I was sitting there guiding me back to this world. Uh, that was at the very end of the coma. That's when I saw six faces that would bubble up out of the muck and then disappear. They'd say a few words, but because of my amnesia, I still didn't understand the language. And those faces were important. I remember them visually now as clearly as if the whole thing happened yesterday. And yet it was all more than 15 years ago. They were important because five of the six were physically present in the ICU room the last 24 hours of coma. Physically so they, present? Sorry? You said they were physically present in the ICU? They were physically present in the ICU room the last 24 hours of coma. Now, there were many other family and friends who had been there during the week who I had no memory of. So what this helped me to do was to realize that the vast majority of my coma journey 
happen between days one and four or one and five of my seven-day coma. I explain the timing of that in the book, Proof of Heaven. But that's important because uh, people in the scientific community think, well, your brain may not have been working during the coma, but when you came out and your brain started working again, it then assembled all of these memories. But I know that's not true because, in fact, those memories of the faces at the very end were distinctly following all of the other spiritual experiences that had to happen before. And in fact, it was the sixth face that was the most important. That was of a 10-year-old boy. Now, uh, I didn't recognize him. My amnesia was still very powerful, but it was my son Bond, and that is a very appropriate name, far more appropriate than I'd ever realized before. Bond was my true connection to this world, and it was, in fact, his face pleading with me uh, I didn't understand the words, but it was that sense of his pleading and a sense of our connection with each other. That's what drew me back to this world was a sense of love for him. Even though I had no idea who he was and couldn't have told anything about fathers and sons at, the po at that point, but the bottom line is he was pleading with me. It was Sunday morning, seventh day of coma. The doctors had said I'd gone from a 10% chance of survival down to 2%, but with no chance of recovery. Hmm. Bond had been protected from the worst news during the week, but he overheard that. He came running down the hallway, pulled open my eyelids. It had been taped shut. I was on a ventilator with a breathing tube coming out of my uh, nose. And uh, he was pleading with me, Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. I didn't understand the words, but there was something about it. I knew I had to come back. And even though throughout this whole journey, because of the amnesia, I'd been kind of protected from any kind of sense of... Uh, uh, you know, having to do something, and I felt like this can all continue or cease, doesn't matter. Now it all mattered. Because mm. of that sense of a loving connection with another soul, everything mattered. And yet I had not yet begun to figure much of this out at all. But that's when I started coming back to this world. Soon thereafter, uh, I was fighting the ventilator. They took out the breathing tube, and I said, thank you. But I was in and out of a crazy, paranoid, delusional, psychotic nightmare for the next 36 hours. The interesting thing is that all the deep coma memories from the spiritual journey are as sharp and vivid and crisp and alive in my memory today as if it all happened yesterday. Whereas memories of that psychotic nightmare that occurred emerging from coma, still with a very sick brain affected by meningitis, I don't remember those at all. So I'm glad I wrote them down. Uh, but uh, not to confuse the two at all, the spiritual journey. And the other important thing that I'll point out before I leave this is there's a medical case report that you mentioned, the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease, in September 2018. There's a case report on my medical records by Dr. Serby Khanna, Lauren Moore, and Bruce Grayson. And they make two very powerful points. One is that my brain was in no shape to harbor any kind of dream or hallucination. That is what is so important to the scientific community, that my, that brain was too wrecked to have a hallucination, much less the most extraordinary, detailed, memorable and life-transforming life set of events of my entire existence. Now, the other important point, when they were challenged by the peer review editors, how do you explain this case? It's unprecedented in the medical literature to be this sick from E. coli meningitis, coma for a week, and then end up making a full recovery. And they said it's because he had a near-death experience. That's what explains that miraculous recovery. So the peer review scientific editor said, okay, we have an explanation. And they published it. They knew of other cases, like Anita Morjani, who had stage four lymphoma, disappeared after her NDE. Dr. Mary C. Neal, uh, orthopedic surgeon, had a kayaking accident over 30-minute warm water drowning in Chile in the late 1990s, brought to the surface dead, but they resuscitated her. She made a full recovery. Um, so in other words, this is the big message to all of us, that a richer sense of spiritual connection can lead us towards wholeness and healing. And uh, to me, as a physician, as a neurosurgeon, that's one of the deepest and most profound messages, uh, you know, to discuss is the power we all have over our own healing and coming into wholeness. You've covered a lot of material. <laughs> it's a lot there. It's a, it's a lot there. Let's, let's go over a couple of things. One, you were told you can do no wrong. So you don't remember a, your life. You may have had a life review, but you don't actually remember having a life review. Yeah, you know, well, I don't remember an Evan Alexander life review. All I remember were those two visions I had in the core realm that were basically generic. Uh, they were these incredibly global visions of how all of this could work. 
uh, and these beautiful individual threads uh, woven into this fabric with this golden center. That was kind of the Christ consciousness. That's how I, uh, you know, interpreted all of that vision was that we were all working towards that oneness with the divine, right. that it takes multiple lifetimes to do so. But right. love is so important. Uh, it's the only critical ingredient. So in other words, when I say that word reincarnation, people should not be worried that their loved one will have, quote, already reincarnated before they get there. That's uh, the main point I have to make about that. But also uh, the reincarnation data makes us pay attention to things like suicide. Uh, because in fact, you know, you, you don't leave your problems behind with suicide. You basically get them repackaged, uh, you know, unless you can deal with the issues in a life review, uh, if you're successful at suicide. Um, but, uh, you know, it's all about a cop. This is where we get the work done is in this material realm. Our souls don't go through a lot of growth process in that between lives realm. It's really what we do here and how we live our lives. And the more we can kind of reclaim a love of the universe for us and use that love to share in healing others in bringing uh, love, kindness, compassion to all of our dealings with self and others. This is really the deepest message of near-death experiences. It has been for thousands of years. It's a good thing that the scientific community is now studying NDEs because we realize they're not dreams or hallucinations. They are beautiful examples of a much richer kind of sense of connection that we have as spiritual beings in this universe. And the best news, of course, is you don't have to have an NDE to come into this knowledge by prayer, uh, centering prayer, meditation. These are all ways that we can come into knowing that we're sharing that mind of the universe, that God mind. And just as I witnessed in the core realm and the deepest part of my journey, I witnessed that, uh, you know, it wasn't coming face to face with God. It was actually realizing that that God presence was the very source of my conscious awareness. You're an emanation of that presence. Correct. Exactly. And yeah. never separate from it. Yeah. This is something, you know, in our modern world with all the political fra fractiousness and what have you, uh, people uh, tend to lose sight of the fact that they have a deep and profound connection with the most loving, powerful force in the universe. And that is that all creative God force. And it's not a judgmental God. This is a God that loves us unconditionally. Uh, and that is where so much of the healing comes from, is recognizing that and bringing that back to this world. Right. Now, when you heard, you can do no wrong, how do you interpret that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, 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 I get a sense that obviously unconditional love and judgment can exist in the same vibration. They're two different frequencies. So as you're saying, there's no judgmental God. God is love. Right. So God is your love. Now, in that sense, right. in that sense, though, I would say that we, you know, in that light, in that experience, you know, anything we've done, because there is a reliving of events. And if you study large series of uh, near-death experiences and life reviews, like Bruce Grayson's report on mm -hmm. almost 700 life reviews in his patient population uh, that came out of the Journal of Near-Death Studies in the fall of 2021, you'll find that uh, something like 40% of them go through an entire life review. Every event of their life is covered, even though it might be only during a four-minute cardiac arrest. But mm -hmm. two other crucial points, um, uh, over 40, almost 50% of them discuss that it's like a reliving of events, not just remembering. But that's the important thing, is to show you the power that that spiritual realm has to demonstrate these events of our lives as a reliving with a chance to rectify situations, things like that. That's what the life review is all about. And the last and probably most important part of the life review that Bruce Grayson points out is that something like 74% of those 700 cases um, were experiencing the life review from the perspectives of all involved. Yes. So, so other, other people involved. So if you're busy handing out pain and suffering to others or being greedy and selfish, in your life review, you get on the receiving end of that you know, you were dealing it out your whole life, but now you feel it from the other side. So in other words, life review is the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated, written into the very fabric of the universe. And that's why it's such a gift. Absolutely. My friend, uh, Daniel Brinkley, do you know Daniel? Oh, sure. Of course. He's yeah, a very Daniel renowned. Discuss, he discusses that as well, that the individuals that he harmed, he felt that harm from their perspective. 
Right. And from their family's perspective and from the gifts they couldn't give because he may have killed them when he was in the service, that type of thing. So it's exactly. not it's not a judgmental God. It's actually us, as you're describing, right. reliving the energy that we put out and reliving that ourselves. But it's not God judging us. No. Us kind it, of judging ourselves, so to speak. It, I, I look at it as kind of a higher soul judgment. I mean, yeah. you know, we live our lives in this ego mind. And, yeah. and people should never make the mistake that their ego mind is their consciousness. Right. Uh, the ego mind is that little voice in your head. I love how Michael Singer, in his book, The Untethered Soul, he calls a voice in the head the uh, the annoying roommate. Yeah. And that's a very good way to put, put it. Yeah. But through meditation, through my NDE, I've come to recognize my little ego mind. And yes, the ego plays a certain role and does certain things, but the ego is involved with addictions. It's involved with severe fear of death and all this kind of thing. The ego really gets in the way. It's not your ally in this kind of rich and deep spiritual journey. And that's why I view meditation as so important. And I often use meditation in kind of a higher soul to higher soul perspective. If I'm having any kind of an issue with someone else, I just go into meditation wanting the highest and best good for all involved and moving far beyond my little ego's demands of what it might want. But that's where meditation and centering prayer for me have become so handy. They've helped me to identify uh, that aspect of myself that is really that higher soul. That's the part that really comes alive and aware uh, when we leave our, our uh, uh, you know, brain and body at the time of physical death. Right. Uh, but this this is really a gift to kind of start glimpsing that higher soul. And the higher soul is always connected with that primordial mind, with that God force. And I think the last thing I'd like to point out about all of that is when I came back to this world, you know, I realized God was a puny little human word with a lot of baggage for me. And that it didn't matter if you wanted to call this beautiful, loving force God, Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, Great Spirit, many names. But don't pretend that they're different. NDEs, uh, near-death experiences across all cultures and across all religions, tend to bring together this notion of love, kindness, and compassion that I would say was a central message of all the great prophets. Mm -hmm. And this is really where some religious ideologies, sadly, have fallen away from that. But the more any religion in the current era focuses on unconditional love, kindness, compassion, mercy, taking care of all of our fellow beings, without being exclusive about that. It's it's not about a club. This is about really taking care of the least, the last, and the lost, taking care of the refugees, taking care of people that, who are less fortunate in this world, and bringing love into their lives by manifesting that that healing love that, that we can experience in centering prayer uh, and meditation. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. When I When I woke up years ago, uh, I was attending USC as a psychobiology major, and I had a series of inner experiences that culminated in a in a death in a lucid dream. And when I woke up, I could see we were surrounded by this presence of love and beauty. And I had come from an agnostic point of view, similar to you. Mm -hmm. And so my name for this presence was simply love, beauty, and then it extended to love, beauty, intelligence. But the word God could not contain it because God meant a guy in the sky or something to that effect. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling exactly what you're saying. Now, you're, you're bringing up another point here. Your brain was so damaged that the individuals thought that it was impossible for you to have those kind of hallucinations or whatever because your brain was so damaged. So you're now speaking about the fact that consciousness precedes the brain. It's not necessarily, brain is not producing consciousness. And this is what, from a materialist, you went all the way to the other spectrum. Well, that is true. And uh, it turns out that's where the scientific community is headed on this. Yeah. You know, neuroscience and materialist science have never uh, come up with any kind of um, linkage to explain how consciousness might arise in the brain. In fact, uh, what they try and do is tell you it's all chemical reactions electron fluxes of material substance following the laws of physics, chemistry, biology. So you don't even have free will, according to them. If it's all chemical reactions, they have a full explanation uh, just through the laws of physics and chemistry. Uh, and so, but quantum indeterminacy is what changes all this. Quantum physics completely upends materialist science. And that's why it's so beautiful 
that the Nobel Prize in physics in 2022 was given for entanglement. Entanglement is the most prominent feature of, of the mystery of quantum physics, and it's right at the forefront of demonstrating the primacy of mind throughout the universe. That we're really working with one mind, and this is where we go in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, that Karen Newell and I wrote in 2017. And that book goes a long way to uniting science and spirituality by discussing uh, this reality of idealism, that is primacy of mind, but really going even further, uh, I think, uh, in the current era, because it's not just mind that is primary, it's this universal God mind. So in other words, the best uh, philosophical label for it is evolutionary panentheism. That is, panentheism is a God force is in all that is, uh, and evolutionary means that there is free will, that uh, quantum indeterminacy is absolutely at the root of our emerging reality. And it has everything to do with the workings of the brain, of our bodies, of DNA. Uh, all of that is occurring down at a quantum level. Uh, and even though when we get to this, this surface uh, kind of macro level, uh, it can be obscured, uh, the reality is, as in that phenomenon of entanglement shows us, is there's a connection of, that transcends space and time across this universe that we are privy to as sentient beings. And that's why that Nobel Prize to me is so absolutely crucial because it's finally putting a nail in the coffin of pure, you know, four-dimensional scientific materialism as the ultimate arbiter of all of reality. What kind of progress are we making? I mean, obviously, there's still tremendous materialism in, in, in the medical field in terms of uh, healing and how to heal, et cetera, et cetera. Where do you see that progress going? Is it, is it quickening now? Well, let's put it, I'll put it this way. The evidence is already out there, available to anyone who wants to read it, that proves not only the afterlife, but proves reincarnation as a general principle operative in human lives. That is at BigelowInstitute.org. Uh, Robert Bigelow is an aerospace engineer. He ran a contest in 2021. He had lost his wife. His son had committed suicide. He wondered, are their souls still really present in any form? Mm. So he put a question to the scientific community. What's the best scientific evidence for continuation of, of a conscious awareness after permanent bodily death? That's mm. the question. He also said you need to have at least five years rigorous experience as a scientist or philosopher or theologian investigating these kinds of questions. Uh, and in that setting, they got 204 essays. He was going to give out three monetary awards. The essays were so good, he gave out 28 monetary awards. Uh, those essays are available for free right now to all of your listeners. Go to BigelowInstitute.org. If you start with uh, Jeffrey Mishlov's winning uh, essay, you'll realize quickly that the question is already settled, uh, that yes, there's an afterlife, no question about it. But then the many other essays from many different directions at BigelowInstitute.org will continue to answer the questions from all different perspectives. People who demand very scientific essays might look for Dean Radin's essay, Bernardo Castrop's essay, Julie Beischel wrote a beautiful essay from Winbridge.org on her quintuply blinded protocols with psychic mediums, et cetera. Bernardo Castrop attacks the whole thing just from the standpoint of quantum, quantum physics and a modern physical interpretation of reality. Uh, Pim Van Lommel has an excellent, uh, his one second place towards the end of his essay. He makes an argument for the one mind hypothesis, and he lists four major scientific resources for the one mind hypothesis. Those would be a paper from Bernardo Castro uh, called The Universe in Consciousness, Journal of Consciousness Studies in 2018. Also, uh, the book Living in a Mindful Universe that Karen Newell and I wrote in 2017. The book One Mind from Larry Dossey. And finally, the book uh, Spiritual Science from Stephen Taylor. Those four resources, Pim Van Lommel thought, were excellent uh, education for anyone on the scientific merits of the one mind hypothesis. That is that we're sharing that one mind, that God mind, and yet our brain is serving as a transceiver or a filter that allows in. But it's by when we leave the shackles of the brain and body, that's when our consciousness actually expands. It doesn't decrease as you know, the materialist scientist like I was before my coma would have tried to argue. But our right. conscious awareness expands. And I think a lot of people who are experienced in meditation and centering prayer, who've had beautiful epiphanies, connections with God through prayer, uh, know exactly what I'm talking about. 
Yeah. So just to break that down simply for people, you became more aware when your brain wasn't working. Correct. And I can give you a quick example from modern science uh, that supports that claim. There are a number of papers that have come out in the last 12 years uh, evaluating people under the influence of psilocybin, LSD, DMT, other uh, serotonin 2A psychedelic substances. I call them entheogens. I do not encourage anybody to go out and use these things, but they're very important for scientific work. I, I prefer meditation, yeah. but I can tell you that we've got a lot of uh, information coming from uh, the papers on the uh, these uh, substances. For example, Robin Carhart Harris in the original 2012 paper uh, using psilocybin, they actually used a visual analog scale too to assess the transcendency and kind of depth of the spiritual experience. Interestingly, what they find is with functional MRI or magnetoencephalography, these are tools we have to really look at every neuron in the brain and all of their activity together as networks. And what you find is when people take those substances, even though they might claim, wow, the phenomenal experience I had, my brain must be lighting up like a Christmas tree. Well, just the opposite is happening. The brain is going dark. In <laughs> fact, the fault mode network, which is supposed to be kind of our ego, you know, sitting here with eyes closed, uh, being present in the moment network, the whole thing dissolves. Uh, and in fact, uh, they found that the more uh, transcendental and uh, uh, kind of deep the experience, the spiritual experience, the more those uh, networks dissociated, uh, fell apart. And so that is telling us the brain is not doing that. Phenomenal experience is not the result of the brain's work. The brain's a transceiver. Uh, but it's not even the source of memory, as we explain in our book, uh, Living in a Mindful Universe. Neurosurgeons have remarked that never has there been a case of brain resection over the last century where any long-term swathe of memories was removed. So memories are not stored in the brain. And when you review the 1,700 cases of solved uh, past life memories in the University of Virginia study, of course, you'll start to realize memories are not stored in the brain because where in the world did those memories come from and those children who had memories from past lives, and only one in five of those children uh, was a heredity case, that is, in the same family. 80% of those uh, cases were, you know, different, you know, towns, different countries, different cultures even. So uh, so the memories are in consciousness, not in the Memories are in consciousness. I would say in an Akashic field, or uh, as Edgar Mitchell, the Apollo 14 astronaut, who mused over these kinds of uh, things quite heavily, as a scientist, uh, he called it the quantum hologram. That would be the information field that contains all potentiality uh, for the, the life events of sentient beings. What would you say about individuals who are suffering from dementia? What's going on there? Well, dementia is interesting. Uh, there's another phenomenon called terminal lucidity or paradoxical lucidity. Uh, and the original paper I saw on this uh, several years ago from Michael Nam, NAHM, and Bruce Grayson had something like 81 cases they'd identified from the literature, but they also said there was a, a large number of statements from psychiatrists uh, and the medical therapists going back into the last century, uh, into, the, into the 19th century even, uh, where people who had been schizophrenic, been psychotic, all these things, as they approached death, they would awaken into <laughs> rationality, into memory, into communication with loved ones at the bedside, et cetera. And then they pass over, often with a smile on their face. So, and something like five to ten percent of Alzheimer's patients uh, have some of this kind of terminal lucidity, uh, where they they seem to kind of wake up right before they die. And statistically, it's very likely to be within the last uh, seven days, and especially within the last twenty-four hours before someone passes. And that number comes even from cases of people who had never been communicative in their entire lifetime. And then as they're approaching death, they kind of wake up. Uh, so that's a beautiful example of how soul mm -hmm. can manifest beyond any limitations on our physical bodies and brains uh, right. to manifest phenomenal experience. I had that experience with an aunt of mine. I didn't, we didn't know each other that well because I was living in Los Angeles and she was living in Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. And so we went to visit her. I sat by her bedside and she woke up. And she started asking me questions about my personal life that she had no knowledge at all about it. And she started talking about the people I knew, and she was just speaking to me. 
just totally alert, totally awake about personal things in my life. And everybody was just amazed because I never had a conversation with her about these things. And then a couple of weeks later, she passed over. But she became very awake, totally knowledgeable about me. We had a beautiful conversation about my life, what school I was going to go to, what I was going to do with my life. She started telling me about my... And then she smiled, you know, and then she went back into this other kind of space where she didn't remember. It was amazing to me. I mean, I was really young at the time, but I always remember Tony having this lucid moment that I said, what the heaven happened? To... Yeah, that, that's what you're describing. Beautiful, Michael. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I also have an example that I, I had in the book, Proof of Heaven, of term lucidity. Uh, and it just so happened to be that it occurred with a friend of mine who was the chairman of one of the top neurosurgical programs on earth. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was there at, with his father. His father was passing over. His father had been with the grandmother, you know, the father's mother, a uh, grandmother to my friend during the Holocaust in the Second World War and had died. Uh, and and this, this man had been 14 years old when all that happened. He never talked about it, didn't talk about her. Now, here he was on his deathbed. And he'd been unresponsive for weeks uh, because of his advanced disease. And as my friend, the neurosurgeon, was sitting there, all of a sudden he came back to life. He saw the spirit of his own mother, that would be the grandmother of my friend, at the foot of the bed. And my friend was absolutely convinced it was completely real to him. He did not say it was a hallucination or delusion. He said it was absolutely real and it brought his father back great communication and memory, smiles, incredible sense of reunion with his mother, who he'd last seen, you know, 60-some years earlier during the Holocaust when she passed, and then he passed over. And my friend didn't know what to make of it until I went up to visit him a year or two later and told him my story, and he went, oh my God, now all of that makes sense. So terminal lucidity is not uncommon. Uh, you know, it's out there in large numbers, but they completely defy the materialist model of brain creates consciousness. But that's why we need to pay attention. If we want to know the truth about reality, we cannot be suppressing evidence. And that's what the scientific world has done for far too long about these kind of cases. And why do you think that was? Why, why were they suppressing it, do you think? Well, that's a good question. You know, people like to think that they know the answers. Uh, and in our culture, we tend to defer to experts, uh, you know, and yet there's nobody who's really expert in any one field uh, to fully explain consciousness. I mean, I found in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, we had to use the expertise of neuroscientists and face up to the hard problem of consciousness, which is an impossible problem for materialism. We had to use a philosophy of mind and the binding problem uh, and their expertise, you know, the binding problem is the apparent unity of consciousness in an individual. If this is all multiple um, neuronal populations all contributing to my conscious awareness, how come it all seems so one, so unified at the get-go? And that's because it's unified coming in. Our, our, our brain is a transceiver that allows a dissociation of a little eddy current from that primordial mind that we think is ours. Mm -hmm. And yet the world of, of, of uh, parapsychology uh, for example, telepathy. Telepathy in uh, uh, twins uh, occurs in about 35% of identical twins, strong telepathic experiences. You can have one twin uh, touch a hot stove and a thousand miles away, their identical twin will develop a blister. I mean, they have very strong connections. And, uh, you know, if you don't study it or know about it, then you don't know about it. But uh, read Guy Leon Playfair's book, Twin Telepathy, and you'll get it. Uh, this, that used to happen with me and my brother. We're three years apart. Uh -huh. and, and, and when he would hurt himself playing football or something, I would feel it and I would get upset because I knew something was happening. And, and I, I learned how to break it because he was, he was a very uh, hard tackler. <laughs> well, absolutely. Well, I'm so glad you pointed that out, Michael. And, and certainly, you know, telepathy is not limited to um, identical twins. Yeah. I just put that out there because it's so easy to demonstrate, you know, 35% yeah. of them. That's a huge number having these powerful telepathic experiences. Uh, but yes, you, you make an excellent point because I've heard of many examples. Uh, in fact, many of the what's called shared death experiences, mm. uh, shared death are just like near death, but they happen in perfectly healthy people. And a shared death experience, one example would be if, say, a woman is dying in Massachusetts and her son is down in North Carolina 
and her soul, as she is leaving uh, her body in Massachusetts, her soul goes through North Carolina to where the sun is out gardening and takes the sun's soul along, even to witnessing a full-blown life review before the bystander soul of the sun comes back. So a shared death experience, they're not uncommon. Read Raymond Moody's <laughs> Glimpses of Eternity or go to Shared Crossing Project, William Peter's work, or read his book, um, At Heaven's Door, and you'll see what I mean. But the interesting thing is some of the people with a shared death, they actually have the symptoms that the loved one is having, you know, half a world away, uh, like a heart attack. They'll feel a crushing substernal chest pain, pain going down the left arm, shortness of breath, et cetera. And I've heard many of those kind of stories. And it's occurring not because they are having a heart attack, but a loved one who they're deeply connected with is, is having a heart attack uh, at some great distance. But it's happening then, and that's their notification about it. You are bringing up so many memories. Like my mother was the person in our family who would go with the loved one to the other side. Mm -hmm. And again, we were living in Los Angeles. We're from D.C. My family was living in D.C. And when someone would pass in D.C., my mother would like, go, help them go to the other side, and then they would say to her, Alice, it's not your time. You can go back. And she would wake us up and say, Aunt so-and-so just passed. Then we would get a phone call from D.C. saying, Aunt so-and-so just passed. But my mother had already told us because she had gone with them. Right. This That's how we so grew up. Beautiful. Yeah, we grew up like we grew up like that way. If, that was if, if people look up, Google um, Shared Crossing Project, William Peters, he's out of Santa Barbara. And like I said a minute ago, his book, um, uh, At Heaven's Door, is all about shared death experiences. So is Raymond Moody's book, Glimpses of Eternity. Hmm. That's where the concept was first introduced. These are not uncommon, but William Peters is actually uh, developing some protocols to help people who would like to have a shared death experience with their loved one to manifest that, that event to happen. So... Uh, the world is going to change radically as we start evolving and developing these kinds of techniques. So, it, a yeah, a couple of things. Um, what have you noticed about yourself that has changed the most since that experience? Obviously, you know now about, you're not a materialist anymore. You know that there's consciousness, the brain's a transmitter, et cetera. What has changed about your character that you noticed? Well, I, I must confess, I've been meditating an hour or two a day for the last 11 or 12 years. I use sacred acoustics. People who want to learn more, go to sacredacoustics.com. It's basically binaural beat brainwave entrainment. Every sound you've ever heard in your life that might have engendered some transcendental state of conscious awareness was processed in the acoustic cortex of the temporal lobes up in the recently evolved part of the brain, circuits that uh, have developed in us in the last one to two million years. Very, very different is differential frequency brainwave entrainment, uh, as in sacred acoustics. Those are slightly different frequencies to the two ears that actually are processed way down in the lower brainstem in a circuit that arose more than 300 million years ago. And there's something about the ancient nature of that circuit. Uh, general principle in evolutionary biology is if you want to know more about a function, look at the anatomy associated with that. So for consciousness as a function, we'd be looking at the brain and its structure, but also look at evolution over time and how, you know, um, life long ago had a very simple kind of nervous system and it's evolved into what we have now. But why is it that when we interfere with this ancient circuit, there was originally a localization circuit so that when I hear a snap behind my head, that circuit is calculating where that sound is. Sound's going a thousand feet per second. And so a very accurate timer in the lower brainstem at microsecond levels of resolution can determine when those signals arise. Well, it turns out we can use that to modulate uh, our, our kind of brainwave states and allow us to escape the, the sense of here now and sense of self uh, by going into deep meditation using binaural beat brainwave entrainment. If people go to sacredacoustics.com, explore her webpage, that's Karen Newell, that's my partner and the co-author of Living in a Mindful Universe. That's her website. She uh, co-founded that company with uh, Kevin Cossey in New York. But uh, they have excellent uh, offerings for very powerful binaural beat brainwave entrainment, which I highly recommend to people who want to do uh, this kind of journeying and exploring. But for me, um, my entire life is flipped because of my NDE, and especially, I would say, with this ongoing practice of meditation. 
uh, because it's continued to refine my uh, sense of relationship with that one mind, with that God force, my sense of being able to bring healing and wholeness to this world yeah. uh, simply by focusing on my uh, healing and wholeness and in deep meditation and then going out and living the life that I discover through this beautiful meditation in form of centering prayer uh, to help other beings. Always realizing that we're in this together. To hurt another is to hurt oneself. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the golden rule is very active in this kind of line of thinking, and it's really about being here for the highest and best good, and that's where my prayers, my meditations, that's where all my daily actions, all my, you know, uh, presentations and uh, conferences, every bit of it is geared towards helping to bring this message of love, compassion, and kindness, and healing and wholeness to all of my fellow beings. Right. I, I'm right there with you. I invite individuals who are who are hating, who are in bigotry, who are in war, to come to an understanding that they're hurting themselves, they're hurting aspects of themselves, that we are each other in disguise. Yeah. And that at some point, you will realize that who you killed was yourself. You, you were killing your brother, but you were actually, you have to, as you just described, you're going to live through that experience, through that person's perception. And I invite people to wake up, put, turn your swords into plowshares, even if you have to go against the prevailing political energies that are out there, it's 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 best to wake up at this time in human history. Well, Michael, I agree a hundred percent, and no question, you know, our world is currently very polarized politically, and you know, I've always thought the answers will never lie at the extremes. The answers will never be out there on the left or right fringe, but they will also always be in the heart uh, of of people, kind of. Uh, uh, paying attention to their own lives, but in in such a sense that they really are here to help others. And once you get to the world of near-death experiences, it's not questionable whether or not that's important, because the ultimate arbiter in all of these NDE stories, going back thousands of years, as Gregory Shushan, who has written about Aboriginal and early culture NDEs, points out, it's always about love. Uh, love and those uh, powers, our departed loved ones come back to escort us over, uh, I also love the work of Christopher Kerr. People often complain. They say, well, you know, a near-death experiencer doesn't die. I want to know what happens when you die. Well, go to uh, Christopher Kerr, head of Hospice Buffalo in Buffalo, New York. Uh, he's an MD, PhD. He's written extensively about this. And he wrote a beautiful book called Death is But a Dream. Mm -hmm. came out about four years ago. And he finds the very same things in terminal care of loved ones coming, of life reviews occurring, people making amends for the wrongs they've done, coming to see love as the important ingredient of our existence. Uh, and that's all in a terminal care population. 89% of his patients had profound experiences that to them were very healing, uh, all about resolving some of those issues where they might have mistreated others or um, behaved badly in life. And what this did was, as they were in the dying process, and that enabled them to come into some peace and harmony by acknowledging the oneness of soul, the binding force of love, how it connects all of us together. And these lessons are very rich. And as you get closer and closer to the spiritual center, it's not as if you find that there's some battle between good and evil where you would have a, a contrary argument supporting evil in that realm. No, it's all about good and love. And in our culture, sadly, you know, with the media focus on bad news and some of the misinformation and disinformation, uh, people end up, uh, you know, hating others. And it's just, it's a tragic uh, loss of human potential uh, that we would uh, lead people to believe that that is close to any kind of truth. Because when they die, they'll find out, no, that was a wrong pathway. It was all truly about love and taking care of each other. And that's how we make progress in this world. That's how we grow as souls. Absolutely. Before we go, those three books that you wrote, tell us the basic difference between the three. Well, Proof of Heaven was my own personal story. It's what happened to me back in uh, 2008, that as a you know, card-toting reductive materialist neurosurgeon, I could not explain. And the medical facts were so damning of any attempt to just dismiss it all as hallucination or dream that I had to come up with a richer answer. I started out as my own, um, you know, worst uh, skeptic uh, because my doctors had told me the dying brain plays all kinds of tricks so you can forget about whatever happened. 
That's what I was trying to do was, wow, that was an amazing experience. I'll write it all down. It tells us something about consciousness. But the more I learned about how ill my brain was, the more I realized it couldn't happen. So that is proof of heaven was my response as a scientist to going through this. The map of heaven is all about the commonality of these experiences. Many people would come up to me after talks and say, oh, well, a Harvard neurosurgeon has this exotic experience. Well, what about the rest of us? Well, the rest of us are having them too in gigantic numbers by the millions. In fact, if you start talking with your neighbors, you'll probably find out they've had them, but weren't really willing to share. People think you'll think they're crazy when they share stories like this. That's one of the reasons I wrote Proof of Heaven was to take the lid off and let people share these stories, especially let the medical profession share these stories. The third book, Living in a Mindful Universe, 2017, that was co-written with my life partner, Karen Newell. She's been a source of rich uh, spiritual wisdom to me. She's lived her entire life as an idealist. Uh, she contributes uh, handily to that work, but it also has a, a deep scientific basis. Uh, it's been endorsed by many leading scientists in consciousness studies around the world. Um, if you go to ebonalexander.com and look on the book page, Living the Mindful Universe, you'll find a long list of endorsements from very respected names, Ed Kelly, Bruce Grayson, Jim Tucker, uh, uh, Dean Radin, um, Bernardo Kastrup, um, Stan Krippner, um, Ram Das. I mean, a whole bunch of people all across the spiritual and scientific spectrum supporting this book. And it really goes the distance by uniting neuroscience, philosophy of mind, parapsychology, non-local consciousness, quantum physics, and explaining why all of these fields are pointing to us the primacy of consciousness. And this is where the evidence leads. We're never going to go back to the sim simple, paltry, and bleak fiction of materialism. But which way forward depends a lot on how we assemble the information. And living in a mindful universe does a lot of that process. And also for your uh, people, I would suggest um, if you want to find out more about that book, you can find out about a workbook that goes with it that's absolutely free at ebonalexander.com. When you get there, 33-day journey into the heart of consciousness. Click on that link. You'll be joining a community of more than 12,000 people who have left their experiences there. And that 33-day journey, um, it goes head-to-head -head with uh, many of the main concepts we bring up in Living in a Mindful Universe, but in a workbook form where people can share their own experiences and the 33-day journey is completely free. Uh, the other place I would recommend people look is at innersanctumcenter.com. That's I-N-N-E-R sanctumcenter.com. There's a mental health practitioner course we did there with Dr. Anna Usum that reflects a spirituality in, in psychiatric healing in the modern era. Also, a series of two years' worth of webinars every two weeks during the pandemic that we did with thought leaders around the world. Uh, all of that at innersanctumcenter.com, as well as a monthly webinar that we still run with uh, some of our biggest fans. And people can get on board with any of those things at innersanctumcenter.com and uh, uh, sacredacoustics.com. Excellent resource for meditation. Outstanding. Doctor, I really appreciate your time. Any final words or any, um, any practice that you would like to give people? You, you talked about your centering prayer any practice you would like to leave us with? Well, I think the main thing is to take that time, 20 or so minutes a day, if you can, for meditation. Longer if you have time. But to go within and to realize that the main goal is to take that little ego voice in your mind, which is often using fear and anxiety as its tools, and putting it into timeout. It can make a request, ask a question, but then learn to just ride the tones, the sacred acoustic music. You're listening through headphones or earbuds in an ideal situation. And you'll see what I mean about riding the tones, but it helps you to escape the, the shackles of the ego mind and start developing a much richer sense of higher soul connected with the universe at large. Take that time out for meditation. Learn more about uh, NDEs and this beautiful literature. Go to bigelowinstitute.org to uh, bone up on all the scientific support for the reality of it all. Uh, and your life will be forever enriched. So thank you, Michael, for having me on. It's great, as always, talking with you. Absolutely. I think, I think I'm going to invite you to do some more things with us here over at Agape. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. As thank always, you, great talking with you. Thanks for all the work you do. I love your energy, and it's obvious that you're speaking from direct knowing and not just from hypothesis. It's, it's beautiful to always be with you. Well, it's all about love. Thanks so much, Michael. We'll talk soon. 
God bless you. God bless you. Bye-bye. Wasn't that beautiful? Dr. Evan Alexander, every time I'm in conversation with him, I just, I love his presence, the feeling tone, and it's, it's, uh, I like to say from time to time that I'll listen to people speak and I can tell whether they know about it or whether they, they know it. And based on his particular experience that he had when he died and was in a coma and came back, I should say, he knows. And it just, that combined with all of his uh, medical knowledge is, uh, is just a powerful teacher for this time in human history. That is Dr. Eben Alexander. Proof of Heaven was his first book. Peace and blessings, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to Take Back Your Mind and Open Up Your Heart, because it's all about love. Peace and blessings. You may have noticed over a number of years or during the period of time that I've had this podcast, Take Back Your Mind, that there's a theme that runs through all of the teachings, and that theme is meditation. You probably will never see me speak a service at Agape International Spiritual Center or at IG Live or podcasts without some aspect of meditation being mentioned. It is the transportation to transformation. It is very difficult to break the habit of being your personality self without some level of mindfulness, without some level of med meditation. You can't change yourself through willpower. You can do behavior modification, but ultimately there must be some kind of insight in which you begin to see who you really are as an eternal being. Meditation, thousands of years, have been practiced for that purpose, which is why it's included in everything that I do. My three services on Sunday precede with the meditation. And so this is why meditation is a part of Take Back Your Mind, and you can also see many of the guests that I have conversation with always come back to what they do on a daily basis. They stop. I used to say, sometimes I still say, SYBD, sit your butt down. When you're about to go do something, sit your butt down. Don't allow the ego to take you off into things that are frivolous before you sit and have a greater awareness of your oneness with life beauty, intelligence, love, whatever word you want to use, it's all the presence that is never an absence. Let's practice for a few minutes together. Allow your feet to be on the ground, unless you're a yogini and you're in your, your lotus position, but other than that, feet on the ground, it's allowed our thumb and forefinger to touch, hands on the lap facing upward. Let's close the outer eye. Let's allow the, the tip of the tongue to touch the roof of the mouth. So that circuit of energy is activated properly. Today, let us Allow the eyes to face towards the space between the eyebrows, not straining it, just an awareness of that space between the eyebrows, simultaneously awareness of the space around your heart center. Now let's establish an intention to wake up. That's your intention. What are you waking up from? You're waking up from the matrix of separation. The matrix of assimilation of reality. Being lost in time and space. You're waking up to your eternal nature, remembering who and what you are. Just establish that as an intention. 
allow your attention to embrace your intention. And allow the body that is breathing, your body that is breathing, allow that breath to be a talisman for being present. You're simply witnessing the breath with an intention to wake up. If the mind drifts, bring it back to the breath and your sacred intention. Your body your thoughts, sensations, sounds are in your field of awareness. They may be distractions, but you're not distracted by them. They're just passing through your awareness. What's most important is your intention to wake up. We give thanks for these precious moments. We allow this moment of the eternal to be carried into our everyday life. With ease, grace, dignity, and power. And it's all happening now. And so it is. We open our eyes. We maintain this state as we move into the world but being of the higher frequency. Have a beautiful rest of your day. I appreciate your letters and emails that you've been sending in, but also the notes you're sending on the Instagram and on the website, thanking me for Take Back Your Mind. And I thank you for your support. As I've said before, if you want to support Take Back Your Mind, Support the sponsors. The main sponsor is the Agape International Spiritual Center, agapelive.com. We have a Facebook presentation, an Instagram presentation, a YouTube presentation, and a website presentation. You can donate to the sponsor at agapelive.com. It's one way that you can donate. It supports the podcast. Second sponsor, is Nutrarise.com. You go to Nutrarise.com, those three lines up at the top, you touch that line, and you'll get Adapta Zen. Adapta Zen are my products. The super green, superfood greens, and the vitamin D3, K2. Both extremely good for your health, your nutrition. You support the sponsors, you're supporting the podcast. Have a beautiful, and as I like to say, a bright day, luminous day, because you are a luminous being. Peace and blessings. Your time is very valuable, so I want to thank you for lending us your ear and participating in taking back your mind. If you want to submit a question for the question of the week, please submit it to podcast at michaelbeckwith.com If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please submit a review and let us know your thoughts. Stay on top of current episodes by subscribing to the podcast 
so that you'll receive alerts and not miss one single episode. And feel free to share this podcast with all of your friends and family. And until we meet again, take back your mind and you will take back your life. Peace and blessings.